Rusty here. <laughs> He's a Blockstream software developer, formerly head deputy at Linux. He's been in the game for well over 20 years. Influential part of Bitcoin's development after developing a majority of the specification for the Lightning Network. Is that about right? Is that a sort of that, very that, that brief was, introduction? I think we lost everyone with that. Yeah, okay, <laughs> awesome. Um, so what brings us here today? What sort of give us a, a quick sort of insight into, you know, where we've come from, either personally, professionally, but also about sort of blockchain and the technology as well? Well, so um, other than the free beer, uh, what brings <laughs> us here today? So, um, OK, that's 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 OK. That was a broad question. We'll start there. Um, mm. I'm a technologist, so that's important to lay out up front. Um, I'm a computer programmer. I'm about as geeky as it's possible to be. Um, so, and when we look at like, um, I don't know what we call like financial and business success, do the opposite of whatever I think is a good idea. Because <laughs> historically, that has been the right one. I'll give you some examples as I go through. Um, I, um, I first got involved with Linux in sort of 94, um, and it became sort of my full-time job in 97. So. Uh, in about 96 or so, I um, was sort of playing around with Linux and you know, just doing what you do when you're a young coder and just messing with everything I could reach. Um, and I was doing some contracting work and I thought, I'm going to go to the, the big Unix conference in the world that was sort of famous at the time, uh, Usenix, and they had this Use Linux track. And I'd used Linux before and everyone who was anyone in Linux was there. I came back from that conference going, this is what I want to do with my life. That's what I want to do. I want to work with these guys. So I polished off some of the stuff I've been doing, and, and next thing you know, that's it. I was the Linux firewall maintainer. Um, and, you know, and then I went to the next Usenix, um, and there was a napkin on the job board going, we want somebody who knows um, IP chains. And I went, okay, I wrote that, but I don't want to work for you. I want to write, <laughs> I want to write the successor, and it's going to take me 12 months, because I'm working on it, you know, I've got a day job. But if you pay me money, I can finish it in six months. Being software, it actually did still take 12 months, even though it paid me full time. But <laughs> that pitch worked, um, and the deal was I sent them invoices, they sent me money. Um, it was a good job. Um, it was interesting because they were a startup, um, they'd, they'd IPO'd by this point, um, WatchGuard in Seattle. Um, I spent a month across in Seattle just, just hanging out with those guys and getting to know them. And right at the end of that month, uh, Dave Bon, um, one of the founders, because I'd basically said to them, look, I figured out, I got my hourly rate, converted it to US dollars, I took 20% off because I was going to just be working on my hobby, right? Mm. Uh, getting that number and he said, we don't pay graduates that much. So I told him you asked for 30% more. Um, thanks, <laughs> mate. So, um, lesson one, my financial skills, very weak. Okay, <laughs> so, um, so that, that's how I started. That was my first full-time open source job uh, in 97. Um, I then, of course, the dot-com boom was picking up. And I went, right, I'm going to get my golden ticket. Linux was hot. Everyone was doing Linux stuff. People were doing, people would literally put Linux in their company name or pr do a press release saying that they used Linux and see their stock price bump. It was insane. Um, so everything was Linux this. Um, my friends over at VA Linux Systems actually got the stock ticket LNUX um, and they IPO'd and they had the largest first day pop ever. So basically, you know, they IPO'd at 30, they went up to 320, like, like that, right? Um, <coughs> funny story, actually, Larry Augustine said, um, so who was that? So, so they did this really cool thing where friends and family um, could get stock options. So basically, normally there's, this, this, there's a clause where you can basically sell stock options to friends and family of your developers and stuff. They extended it to all the open source devs. And I was an open source dev, I said, cool, I will, I'll buy 30 mm. stock in your whatever it was. Um, I got some. I saw it go up and go, wow, I'm rich. But, aha, uh -huh, capital gains. I'm going to wait for a year. <laughs> <laughs> so, when I caught up with Larry Augustine, the now billionaire um, founder of VA Linux Systems, I told him this story. He goes, why didn't you sell? I'm like, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> Turns out there's some, like, you know, regulation things around telling people to sell your stock, Chris. <laughs> but, so, yeah, um, not so much. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> so anyway, um, so, so Linux went up and it went down and um, we just kept working on it because we're geeks and it was fun. Um, and then it kind of took over the world sometime in there. Um, 
So have you seen that hype cycle uh, go up and down and, and everyone write it off? I got interested in sort of Bitcoin originally uh, around sort of 2011, 2012, um, just from a like a, a, it's another open source project. I love open source projects. So let's look at this. Okay, they're doing a kind of cool stuff. Um, doesn't seem completely crazy. Um, and then, of course, it went up to $1,000 a Bitcoin. And everyone's going, whoa, you know, Lambos and everything else. Um, and then it crashed back down to like, I don't know, $200 or something, and $2, whatever it was. Um, it, it, went, you know, it went up and it went all the way down. Everyone's like, it's so dead. It's completely over. And I went, I've seen this story before. I've seen this story before and I've seen what happens. Um, the geeks actually keep working and stuff comes up again. So. Mm. So, so where are we thinking is that now? Are we, are we buying? Are we selling? Are we waiting and seeing? You know, I've, I've, I've got, a, I've got maybe listen. like 0.8 yeah, yeah, yeah. Bitcoin yeah. sitting yeah. around somewhere. Yeah, yeah. now that's what I'm looking for. Give me the advice <laughs> yeah, yeah. and I'll do exactly the opposite as okay. per your advice. So, yeah, um, I promise you I don't know. Okay. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so, so I kind of went through that crash. And um, um, my wife said to me something very kind of insulting, but very, very, probably very true. She said, you're much nicer to live with when you're working on something you're passionate about. And I'd been working um, full-time for IBM by this point um, for over 10 years, working on Linux and, you know, senior Linux maintainer and doing my stuff and everything else. But it was comfortable. You know, it was, it was easy. You know, I love the people in the Linux community. It was awesome. Huge worldwide community of hackers, all, you know, um, all great. Um, but there was this hot new thing. And I was like, you know, I've hit 40. If I don't career switch now, that's it, I'm going to retire on this Linux mm -hmm. thing. And I'm like, no, nothing wrong with that, but it's time to be the new kid on the block. So I did a sabbatical, took five months off, um, and hacked on uh, a project, that's a long forgotten project now, um, trying to do microtransactions, uh, basically on Bitcoin. At the end of that, um, someone released a paper showing me how I should have done it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that company was Blockstream. Um, so funnily enough, I talked with them and said, why didn't you tell me? Um, that you were doing that right. Uh, so, um, and then so six months later, I ended up working for Blockstream. Um, and when I joined them, they said, this other paper's been released. We want you to go over there and implement that. So that's kind of how I got here. Nice. So, so where, where we're at, uh, what, Sorry, was, what was that other paper? The lightning paper. The mm -hmm. paper with the lightning paper. So, so where we're at at the moment, let's sort of take a, a long view and go look 10, 20 years into the future. You know, there's potential for blockchain and Bitcoin and all these mm. coins to be just a bubble that disappears and relegated to history. What, what would be your take on where's the technology going to be in 10 or 20 years from now? Is okay. it sustainable? And that's, yeah, blockchain and um, well, that's DLT. A, that's, yeah. that's a really, really hard question. Um, so, but, but let's, let's, zoom, let's zoom out a bit. So, well, it's more just the, the opinion. It's sort of interesting yeah. to hear the, the opinion. So yeah. it's, it's, it's even hard to formulate the question. So, so if we zoom out a bit. So <coughs> electronic cash, right? Um, there are a few milestones in the development of electronic cash. Um, the first one would probably be 1978, the invention of digital signatures. Um, so public, public key crypto, basically. I've got this secret number. I do mathematics, turn it into this public key. You take my public key. And now I can sign a message that proves that I'm the person who holds the secret number. And you can validate it. Similarly, you can sign a message using that public key that only I can read holding my private key. That's public private key crypto. This was a revolution. This was like amazing stuff. That was back in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, and then you think, OK, well, that almost loses the ability to make cash, right? Because I'll just be. I'll have my secret number and I'll tell you my public number and, and then I can write a check going, cool. And you can go, yeah, that's definitely from Rusty. The problem is, of course, that I could write as many checks as I want. Just, this is digital, right? So just make 1,000 copies and <coughs> spend my money a 1,000 times. Um, so the solution to this came in like the 90s. Um, uh, David Chow with DigiCash had this great idea. So um, the trivial way to solve this is basically have a bank that you always ask, like, you know, so has, is, this, is this valid? But that's not really digital cash, that's a digital bank account. That's pretty trivial. The bank holds all the money and they tell you whether you can have it. Not interesting to geeks. DigiCash had this really cool system where you could basically, they could vouch for the fact that, that the transaction was valid, but they didn't actually know what they were signing. So it was, it was blinded cash and basically there was this small math, 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 math. And um, basically the bank could check that everything was valid, but they didn't know who was spending money. So you got your privacy, but it was still centralised. And that was awesome until they went bankrupt and shut down. And everything broke because that central server was gone. 
Um, and that pretty much put a crater through the industry for the next 10 years until the Satoshi paper came out uh, in 2008, uh, 2009, 2008, software release 2009. Mm. Um, so Satoshi comes along with this paper that says, hey, actually, here's a system that allows us to avoid this central point of failure, this distributed system. Um, the whole proof of work thing that everyone talks about, that was the Satoshi invention. So everyone went, oh cool, that, that final, that's the final bit that we need to make this work. And Satoshi actually released some open source software. It was written for Windows, but still, it was open source software. <laughs> and it let you, you know, you could download it and you could run it and it would mine blocks on your computer and connect to the network and everything else. So um, that, that, that became Bitcoin. So um, for technical reasons, basically, everyone works as hard as they can to solve a problem that lets them validate the transaction, lets them sort of block up the transaction. So it's a chain of blocks, it's a blockchain. When people talk about blockchain, that is not what they're talking about. Geeks, when they're talking about blockchain, that's what they're talking about. Everyone else that's talking about blockchain is talking about the other bits, everything else. They're talking about digital signatures. They're talking about stuff that computer scientists are going, we could have done that in the 90s, but it wasn't sexy then. It's sexy now. So when people talk about blockchain, they're usually talking about this idea of not radical decentralization, not the Bitcoin style ideal, which has definitely not been achieved, but in theory, where no single party can control everything or censor everything because anybody can join and become a miner and join the network and everything else. And everyone in the network is validating that everything's okay. They're talking about a permission system. They're talking about, well, see, that only works for Bitcoin. It doesn't work for anything else. I'll give you an example. Imagine, who here has bought or sold property, like a house? Yeah, okay. Were you amazed at like this primitive thing where the lawyers get together and swap stuff over and that mm -hmm. thing, right? Okay, it's like, we could put that on the blockchain. Wouldn't that be awesome? Mm -hmm. And that's how you lose your house. <laughs> so this idea of this uneditable database that no one can fix should scare the fuck out of you. The, it actually turns out there's only one case where you really do want whether the least harmful thing is to just write it out, and that is with cash. Cash being fungible is an okay thing. It's a trade-off, but it's okay. Your house being, fung being non-fungible is not an okay thing. To have it accidentally transferred to someone else and no one can fix it. And you literally have to go up to me and go, my lawyer fucked up and gave you a house. <laughs> <laughs> can we please, please, please have it back? Um, good luck with that. Um, so it turns out most things, you actually want a central authority that can override things. Mm. Well, this crazy idea of Bitcoin where everybody's mutually distrusting, checking everything everyone else is doing, it's way, way simpler if you've got someone who can just tell you the truth. If you trust them already, go for it. They just go, yes, yes, it's your house, yes, it's mm. your house. What blockchain is doing is basically going, well, okay, you sure, we trust you for the source of truth, but we will all audit what you're doing. So instead of you just having a website where I can go, whose house is this, and it will tell me, um, like an electronic deeds registry, you'd actually have some system where you would be able to validate all the transactions that have occurred. So you might still have to trust them to some extent, but at least if they did something outside the bounds, you'd be able to go, hold on, wait, 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 wait. You moved that house without a valid signature from the person who owned it. What the hell is going on? Mm. Let's go to court. Right. So is, is that built into blockchain at the moment, that sort of digital signature and validation, or is that you know, part of the utopian future that we're envisaging in sort of 10 or 20 that, years. That time. part is generally there. So, so what, but what we're seeing is, is this, this broad swath of different, you know, blockchain is being applied to, blockchain is the paint you paint on stuff to make venture capitalists, to attract venture capitalists, okay? So it is being used very, very broadly. So when you try to get down to what exactly it is, you get into very difficult things. A blockchain is whatever you want it to be. <laughs> um, you know, or so whatever you want to sell it to. Whatever, whatever you're that. selling yeah. at the moment, right? So, uh, but generally when we talk about blockchain, we're talking about an actual system where people can openly audit something. Now, when it's put that way, it's bloody boring, right? It's basically, it's like accounting nerds would, would love that kind of stuff. And, and like, you know, but, and that perhaps is why it didn't take the world by five, what if you call it open databases or something like that? Mm -hmm. It would be a small fest, but blockchain sounds cool. Um, and it's got this sort of backstory of, you know, Bitcoin and this graphs going up like this and they truncate it before it goes down like that and all that stuff. And wow, that's awesome. 
and it gets people's attention. So that's why blockchain mm -hmm. is, is becoming a thing. Um, so we're definitely in a hype cycle at the moment. It's definitely going to go back to something real. Yeah. But I think we will see permanent long-term effects. Yeah, and it's like when you're sort of talking about like blockchain as a thing, is there is where are we getting to with consensus? You know, I understand there's a debate at the moment about the size of the blocks and you know, block size okay. and that type of thing. And there's sort of forks in the software and a, a bit of dissent. Are we working towards a, a unified vision of a single blockchain standard? Mm, okay. So um, okay. So. Satoshi did this crazy thing that no one thought was possible, and that is to actually bootstrap a currency that was unbacked. Um, no one's really done that before. Um, people have always claimed backing. The best, the closest they've gotten to having an unbacked currency is they lied about the backing, right? It's like, no, no, I'm issuing these, and really I'm holding gold one for one, whatever, right? Um, but a non-state actor launching a currency is something that wasn't really possible. Now, he kind of had to do that, because technically you require the in-currency thing for Bitcoin to work, right? So he didn't really have a choice. But that is the bit that attracted other people who were like, holy crap, because literally it's a license to print money. I mean, that's exactly what Bitcoin is doing, right? So hence, everyone went, well, I could do that. And so we ended up with this altcoin phase. Everyone was like, you know, rusty coin. Yeah, let's do it, you know. <laughs> and, you know, <sighs> People would literally do one a week at this point. You'd pump it. It was, it was a very, very polished machine of how to sucker people into basically you, buying pumps. You buying did that yourself, did you? You started I, a coin? I stayed What's the it? fuck away. Um, no, okay, I, I started a, a, a coin called Petty Coin, um, which nobody else ever used. Um, and it was, it was basically using real Bitcoins on a, what now called a side chain. So I didn't actually invent my own currency for exactly mm. these kind of problematic reasons. Um, so funnily enough, the ability to transfer money around the internet, uh, you know, to anyone in the world is also the ability to pick people's pockets around the world and um, that proved remarkably attractive to a certain kind of person. And these people like flooded in to the, to the industry. And so <clears throat> Bitcoin has got quite cynical about anything that wasn't Bitcoin um, because the vast majority of them were scams. Now, the good news is that the days of altcoins being like the most toxic, horrific scam you could ever, ever imagine are long past because now we have ICOs which are, <laughs> like it's the same people, <laughs> but <laughs> this is another level of scam and it, it, it's sort of amazing to see. Um, you know, in theory there are, you know, I've had people, this argument with people going, but you know, there could be good ICOs. It's like, yeah, there could be good flaying alive too, but I just don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and we don't see it. Um, in practice, you are going to make farm. Why would you spend money on real tech, on hard problems that haven't been solved before? There's no evidence that the market's paying off for that. They're paying off for marketing. Um, and that's, that's a very clear message of the ICOs at the moment. Uh, you market, you hope you don't go to jail. That's mm -hmm. the basic two ICO games, right? <laughs> and we don't know about the second one yet, but certainly this, this, this is the, the step. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a whole heap of murkiness over the whole industry. And that, that, of course, clouds any kind of discussion about what about, you know, people ask me all the time, oh, have you heard of this? What, they're, they're promising this, 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 this. Mm. And I go, it's a scam. And they go, but you don't know anything about it. And I'm like, that's right. That's why I know it's, it's a, a scam. scam. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, and, and literally, there are thousands of these. Um, and you can go mad trying to follow them. So you know, even if there were a gem in there somewhere, um, they're almost certain to be like stampeded by the people. It's much easier to promise than it is to deliver. So, so, so the utopia, sort of what I'm hearing, is the utopia is we've got um, a single currency run on blockchain and then a single um, blockchain which is governing property exchanges. Oh God, I and it, yeah. Um, so <laughs> I, I think, yeah, yeah we, we end up with some kind or, of or is the, or more is, auditable yeah. database. So mm. uh, one of the things that we have seen advances in is personal security. So um, people no longer keep Bitcoin on their laptop. Is anyone here keeping Bitcoin on their laptop? Jordan. Where are you? Okay. Are we talking like more Bitcoin than the value of your mobile? So my rule is don't keep more on the device than the device is worth. <laughs> just, just as a rule. Is anybody doing that? <laughs> God. Yeah. Okay, maybe you're richer than me and you don't care, right? But... No, no, I'm not talking physically on your, I'm not talking like physically on your phone. That's fine. You tend to take a while off. That's... No. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, th this, these practices have improved, like mm. that kind of thing. Mainly because everyone who didn't follow those practices has now been wiped out. But um, so, so we have seen advances in personal security. I mean, the whole, um, 
hardware wallets and stuff like that is definitely a step forward. Mm -hmm. So perhaps there is a future in which you could legitimately have a digital signature that's worth something. Mm -hmm. um, but at the moment it's like, well, this could be from you or someone could have hacked your Gmail again. You mm -hmm. know, it, and, and that, that is not, that's, that's sufficient if we're chatting, but it's not sufficient for any kind of legal documents and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, maybe we get to a future where that becomes a thing and then that enables a whole heap of things by itself. Mm -hmm. Digital signatures that are actually useful would actually be useful. Shock horror, right? <laughs> and maybe we get led there because people suddenly care because they've got a thousand bucks worth of Bitcoin sitting on their phone and suddenly they actually care. And so they're going to buy a little dongle that, that secures it or something. Mm -hmm. um, but it's sort of an indirect effect. Yeah. So, so how, do, how do we get to that space? Um, more sort of specifically... Wait, <laughs> no. Um, more specifically in Australia, it's sort of I'm getting the impression there's a, there's a lot of development needs to go on. There needs to be a lot of uh, collaboration between developers and industry. Yep. Um, a lot of um, startups and entrepreneurs need to be thinking about blockchain, but doing that responsibly with, you know, deference to great developers. Yep. What would be your views on building that ecosystem okay. in so Australia. So here, here comes the disclaimer. Um, the best tech doesn't always, this will shock you, I'm sure, the best tech doesn't always win. Um, and it certainly doesn't always make the most money in the short term. Um, so I guess my role here is to make sure that you know where the tech is. So when you know you're going beyond what the tech is actually capable of, you're at least, you know the old joke about the difference between a used car salesman and a computer salesman? The used car salesman knows when he's lying. It's a bit like that with blockchain, right? I want you to know when you're lying, right? <laughs> when you're kind of promising something that's perhaps a bit ambitious, I want you to know that you're doing that, um, right? <laughs> that's the best that we can hope for, let's be honest. Um, so uh, your question of like what needs to be done, time. Development takes time. You know, everyone's going, oh, cool, we could do fantastic things. And that enthusiasm is awesome and wonderful unless you're taking other people's money to fulfill it. In that case, you actually have responsibilities and you should be looking, okay, what's our timeline here? When we look at the Bitcoin experiment, I'm like, okay, it's going to take a generation. Ask when Bitcoin's 25 years old, not nine years old, then I'll we'll be able to give you a verdict. You know, mm -hmm. was it sufficient? Um, uh, was it necessary? Was it worthwhile? And these are the three questions that you have to ask. Um, and we, the jury's still out on that, right? Uh, Nakamoto's proof of work, was it sufficient? Was it enough to create decentralization? Or did we end up still having one player holding 60% of the network? If we did, we failed. Was it necessary? Go the other way. Maybe it's not necessary to have this massive proof of work where people are trying to chase the <coughs> cheap, cheapest electricity around the globe. Maybe we could have just nominated 100 people at random and gone, look, if more than 60 of these people agree, that's not good enough for me, and done it that way. Way, way cheaper. Ethereum's going to that model, right? They're going to like a proof of stake kind of model because it's like way more scalable and they have massive scalability problems, so let's just go there. Um, it's basically a question of how much security can you trade off. Maybe that was, maybe that was all people wanted. Maybe they were just people who just didn't want a government-controlled currency that could inflate and they just wanted something like that. Is it worthwhile? It's a question of, okay, so even if we did need all this stuff, we did need proof of work, we did need everything else, was it worth it? At the end of the day, when we look at, cool, we've got this great currency that's useful for international exchange and everything else, there are going to be knock-on effects if that is if that's the case. Was it worth it? Was it worth the environmental cost? Now, fortunately, environmental cost is a lot better than it would have been if we'd done this 20 years ago, because all the cheap power is generally green. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's sort of the only saving grace. But you know, uh, we will. I think we'll have that argument in 20 years, 25 years. Was it worthwhile? Like, if the U.S. dollar collapses as the world's <laughs> reserve currency, that's such a massive geopolitical shift that we may go, "Holy shit! What have we done?" Someone's like, someone's focused on the main yeah. game, but what would that do to the price of Bitcoin? I agree with everyone that's focused on the price of Bitcoin, but if that's based on a fiat currency and that gets yeah. undervalued yeah. to a point where it's, not, it's worthless, yeah. then what is Bitcoin worth? Because there's nothing to compare it against. Yeah, that's I always also said if Bitcoin's worth a million dollars, that's because a million dollars isn't worth anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that sort of touches on the interesting point that you raised too about you know, the, the environmental impact of you know, blockchain. As the, the system scales and becomes more distributed, the actual cost of maintaining the system isn't distributed, it's multiplied. You know, the more computers it runs on, the more electricity we're going to have yeah, to spend that, to do it. Really and it's like, is yeah, that, yeah, yeah. where do you sit on that? Like, We've got how many computers in this room right now? I mean, like at least one per person, plus the ones in the, you know, like mm -hmm. that's not the cost. The mining is the cost. So mm. 
basically the way Bitcoin works fundamentally is if you want to break the network, you have to beat all the existing miners. And that means the security of the network, can, you can put a dollar amount on it. Um, and the dollar amount is probably in the billions, but you can kind of go, well, you have to outspend those people. So if you want to secure, say, I don't know, all the world's housing information worth a few trillion dollars um, against an attacker, you're going to need to spend that kind of money securing the blockchain. And that's just, that's just the physics of the situation. Um, and that's quite concerning because okay. that's, you know. I've got a question around the, so we've been looking at doing a blockchain based business. I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now we're more looking at, at being more of a cryptocurrency based business. Um, and I'm not particularly concerned with um, blockchain technology at the moment because, I mean, because I've been travelling around the world and talking to a whole bunch of people. And it seems to me that the blockchain infrastructure at the moment is very much like a dirt road with a few cars, T model Fords that can bounce up. That, yep. That's the analogy that I've got in the line. Um, in your mind, um, when do you see that there would be a seismic shift in the infrastructure that we've actually got so that, so that um, what do I call it, commercially viable DApps and you know, things can actually be built on and use the blockchain so that successful business models can flourish on it. So I've been working the last three years on... Outside of Australia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I've been working the last three years on, on, on something similar, which is uh, basically, you know, how do we make this usable? So, um, uh, so the Ethereum thing where they've basically gone, we'll, we'll do this fully programmable. Thing. So um, I have some fairly strong views on Ethereum, but I will tone them down for the audience. Um, <laughs> we're now cut loose. We, so, we, 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 we want to hear. We're all friends here. We're very curious. Yeah. Hello, internet. Um, so. Uh, <coughs> So the Ethereum, I mean, basically, you know, Bitcoin existed, Ethereum kind of went, we have to do everything different because you've got to sell, right? You we're know, not going to make any money if you just promise. We're going to do like a Bitcoin only slightly better. You have to sell everything. So the, the whole, we're going to be fully programmable, et cetera, et cetera, which introduces this whole own war range of problems, which is why they go through the debate of like how much security can we drop now in order to scale. They will probably never scale. But it's possible that something like that could scale. Uh, basically, if you end up removing stuff off the infrastructure, so you put the minimum amount a pressure on the infrastructure in order to, to span things out, you can do some interesting things. Um, doesn't really matter what that infrastructure is. Now, we're probably 10 years away from that. Um, for example, for the last three years, I've been working on something called Lightning, which has been mentioned a couple of times, um, because Bitcoin's actually terrible for payments. I mean, it's, it's terrible for payments because it's not a currency you've got in your wallet to start with, but it's really terrible for payments because of the, the delay problem. Yeah. You know, um, <clears throat> fundamentally, um, blocks come on average every 10 minutes, it turns out there are some transactions where that's okay. If I'm buying a house, not a problem. I can wait for an hour or whatever. Um, if I'm buying a coffee, it's an awful problem. Um, and if I'm buying something digitally over the internet, it's a terrible problem. It's bad enough if you accept it and then you know, you're gonna ship me something and you know, so you kind of nominally accept it and you just double check before you actually put it in the post. Um, but we're talking virtual goods, it's hopeless. Um, this didn't stop a whole heap of companies starting up going, oh, we're going to do blah, 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 mm. blah. And we're going to do zero conf and stuff like this to try to paper over this problem uh, for you. But it was never really going to work. Um, so what do you think would be the infrastructure that's going to win? I mean, we've got Ethereum, we've got... Uh, so what I'm talking about is um, forget about the crypto, like Bitcoin. Oh, I've got my own views on Bitcoin. But anyway, um, but in terms of creating valuable business models. You know, so that's what Ethereum is trying to do. So through the ICO thing, and then they're trying to create this whole ecosystem. Really? Because I thought the ICO thing was all about the Ethereum founders trying to cash out. But anyway, go on. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then you've got Neo, and you've got a whole other major like, platform plays. Which ones, do you think, which ones do you think actually had some kind of future? I don't think anything but payments makes sense. I don't think the other things make any sense at all. I think dApps don't make sense. Okay. Someone, <laughs> all the interesting problems eventually come back to a source of truth. Mm -hmm. Like if you and I want to place a bet on who's, what the weather's going to be tomorrow, which is a valid, perfectly valid thing to do, it's basically insurance for against weather mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Whose weather are we trusting? Well, what the hell are you doing? Why are you wasting your time with a D app, spreading this bullshit all the way around the world to multiple nodes and having mining and all this stuff because you're trusting the weather guy? You know, 
that it's not trustless, you haven't done anything useful, and almost everything useful is outside the system, other than actually transferring currency, which is that's what the system's for. So I don't believe those models, as far as like, they're not, like, you know, I can write a system that does that, that has exactly the same trust properties, that's far, far simpler. So, other than getting to write some cool code, you haven't won anything. So going back to that earlier question about, well, where is blockchain and Bitcoin in 10, 20 years time, it's a payment platform, mm. and that's that's it's a where payment it's uses. Yeah. There is some useful in time stamping. So you can put something in the blockchain that basically says, "I existed at this point." Mm -hmm. We have those. There's two classic cases of doing that. One is you publish something in the newspaper, and you can go back to the newspaper and point. The other one is the whole self-addressed letter. The, you know, uh, anyone ever like done some songwriting or whatever? The classic advice is, you write your lyrics or your whatever, and you mail it to yourself, and you leave it sealed. So when the court case comes up because some asshole at the recording company stole your song, you produce this in court and you go, here it is, and they, the judge opens it up and mm -hmm. they go, there's the lyrics, clearly, right? Time stamping service. Mm -hmm. They're not huge industries, those two, right? You'll notice that. It's still useful, don't get me wrong, but that's not multi-billion dollar industries. Time stamping's not a big thing. Um, and so the other ones, I haven't seen anything that actually makes sense. Time stepping makes sense when tied to um, this kind of open database idea. So then anyone can go back and validate that, yes, at this time, you said that this was the state of the database, the state of the, the, the you know, whether it's, it's housing tracking or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So adjunct systems make sense. And those we'll start to see. But when we talk about putting stuff on the blockchain, <coughs> blockchains work by everybody checking everything. Now, Ethereum has a weaker version of that, but it's still the same kind of idea. That just doesn't scale. Mm -hmm. The only reason we can even think of such a system is how incredibly fast computers have become. But there's still a limit. Mm -hmm. And they're not speeding up as much as they used to. So, if you're looking for this growth like this, it just doesn't work. Everything falls apart. Uh, Bitcoin's been through this battle already, and we, we kind of knew it was coming, but a lot of people were still pitching this idea of it's going to be this free, infinitely scalable thing. And the engineers were sitting there going, it's not and it can't be. It didn't kind of stop people from like going ahead on that road. Um, Ethereum's going through the same thing at the moment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, this is where we see the hype detached from the engineering reality. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't some grains of truth in the hype, mm -hmm. but I'm extremely skeptical. Okay. As an ex-IBM employee. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you a story about a large company I used to work for, <laughs> who will remain nameless, <laughs> who got extremely excited about a project that we'll call Virtual Worlds. Because we wouldn't call it Second Life, because we rename things. So, so a distributed ledger, oh, sorry, Virtual Worlds was the uh, technology. <laughs> yeah. And you've got to understand how exciting this was. This was clearly the future. This is what everyone was going to do. Yeah. Everybody was there. The Australian Open was shown there. Sure, it was only shown to four people, but the press releases made <laughs> it sound fantastic. And the point was that every company in the world went, mm. we're doing a pilot. Everyone was doing it. They were doing something in there. They were, you know, setting up teams to investigate, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was all on. It was, it was incredible. And it stopped so fast. Right. When it ended, it ended. It, it, you turned around and you were like, where's everyone gone? Mm. Tumbleweeds rolled through the entire industry. Just like teenage sex, everyone's talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It, it, it really was one of those. And, and the thing is, it had compelling use cases. Everybody knows eventually virtual worlds will be a thing. Nobody, I doubt anyone in this room doubts that. At some point in the future, we will absolutely be having these awesome, you know, experiences of, of virtual environments that don't actually exist today. We'll be interacting on them, we'll be doing our shopping, whatever it is, right? And we're certainly having sex in them. There will be, <laughs> virtual worlds will be a thing. Like if not for us, it'll be our kids or whatever. Very few people doubt that promise, that it's gonna be there. Turns out the timing was wrong. Turns out the technology was here and the hype was here. And that gap was insurmountable. Right? Sometimes the gap isn't. Sometimes the technology actually catches up and you get close enough. I've been through three VR revolutions. 
<laughs> all of them fizzled. <laughs> We're currently going through a fizzling of one now. Mm. So, you know, uh, yes, everyone's talking about it. Absolutely. But I have seen this before and it can turn very, very fast. Um, people are very excited to do things, but when you dig down, there's often a blockchain paint over a very old system that they've basically just rewritten. Because one of the attractions for the industry is that the back-end systems are often really ancient. They're creaking. They're from the 70s, or they're literally two guys faxing each other to make the <laughs> thing work. <laughs> you laugh. This is, actually, <laughs> this is actually what the kind of stuff that happens. It's true. And nobody was ever interested in rewriting these systems. The one thing that the blockchain thing has done is suddenly everyone's talking about rewriting back-end systems, financial systems. And if you're inside one of those companies going, I cannot believe we are still paying for this 1970s mainframe, blockchain, baby. You could just get as much money as you want to do blockchain. Now, even if blockchain turns out to be, we just modernise our systems, oh, and we didn't blockchain, oops. Um, <laughs> that, that's okay, right? Um, and we've seen, you know, so, so there, there, is, there is going to be some, some effects from this, but they're going to be quite boring and mundane. Um, you know, now, that's not to say that some of these projects, because my counterpoint there is Linux, where the whole thing died, the geeks were still enthusiastic about it, and the technology took over the world. Ten years later, right? So some of these gems may come out, but that's a very long time to wait. Mm -hmm. um, so at the moment, we're in this case where the engineering's here, and the hype is here. And I don't think we can bridge that gap. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that the most important thing and the most valuable thing and the thing that's going to have the most longevity is the currencies that come, that are born from blockchain, but not blockchain itself. I think so. I, I think we're going to see more open databases. We're going to see more of this idea that, sure, you run the database, but other people who care about it can also double check that you're, that you're following the rules, where the rules are some kind of digital signature, kind of, you know, they must approve this, or maybe even a group of people must approve changes, right? <laughs> Um, that works with existing systems. You get a court case that says, no, that house actually belongs to you, then you get 60% of the people to sign off on it and it's all okay, right? That mm. works within the rules of the system. A completely autonomous system that just does its own thing, well, we've seen that that doesn't work yeah. in Ethereum. So then your, I guess to carry that on a little bit more, is then what we're talking about is the potential for new types of economies, new economic systems, new ways of dealing with people. Is that the thing that... That's what I'm excited, excited about. So, so yes, um, I've been working on microtransactions. So microtransaction... Um, so when Visa talk about microtransactions, they're under $10. That's not a microtransaction. A microtransaction is like a fraction of a cent. We have never been able to send a fraction of a cent around the world, ever. It, <laughs> what is it, a G or something? What's the lowest thing of an Ethereum? A, 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 a gig or? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how they. Yeah. Like the, the smallest unit of a Bitcoin is a Satoshi. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. one hundred millionth yeah. of a Bitcoin is a Satoshi, yes. right? Um, and we can send that around the world, actually. No, you pay. Okay, admittedly, you will pay about five Satoshi to send one Satoshi. So that's <laughs> like. A, I mean, one Satoshi, you know, hundred millionth of a Bitcoin is, is still pretty fucking small. Um, but, you know, uh, if you want to send a tenth of a cent, we've got a system to do that, right? That's what we've been working on. That's what we've worked on for the last three years. So that opens up possibilities that we haven't had before because it simply have not been able to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, sure, at the moment, people are mainly using it to pay dicks on this place called Satoshi's Place. Um, <laughs> literally, you pay like, it's, it's like the million dollar homepage, only you can reuse it, and you pay like one Satoshi a pixel. So for like 60, for like about 100 bucks Australian, you can pay the entire million pixel canvas, um, <laughs> and yeah, many people use it to paint dicks. But the point is, <laughs> yeah, so proud of technology, it's like, I enabled this, right? <laughs> well, it's like the scientists, they land on Mars and get the rover to draw a big dick in the dirt. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, mm. so yeah, kids today. Anyway, the point, the point is that, Nerds and scientists. Yeah. that he, here's something that wasn't possible before. Now, um, not being a business guy, I have no idea what people will do with this. But I do suspect that when you create something that's genuinely new and you basically open up to the world, people tend to come along and do stuff that 
I mean, I can think of a whole heap of things, but I'm sure that's not it. I'm sure someone's going to come up with something that I would go, that is the stupidest idea ever. And one day they may fly here in their corporate jet, you know, billion, you know multi-billionaire, buy me a beer in order to tell me I'm a fucking idiot. <laughs> because that's the way the world works. So, you know, I'm sure it'll be some idea that I think is ridiculous, but, but that will take off. So, that I think is incredibly exciting. Crypto kitties, you know, that's mm. right, you know. Uh, It'll be something that everyone everyone thinks is ridiculous. Yeah. Could, could you say though that uh, what it's going to enable is uh, it, it's not just that we've got technology to send it around the world in the value transfer, but there's now this unique piece of this intermediation mm. that we haven't had before. All the way up until now, it's always been a uh, third party to do value transfer. Mm. So you might see blockchain uh, as a platform for you know, social media. So, so this is this is one of the classic arguments, right? It's like, is it useful because it's decentralized, or is it useful because it does things that, that other things can't do? Um, so, it'll be really interesting to find out. Um, we may find out if Visa introduced a one cent payment thing, which they probably won't, because it would totally undercut their whole model. But um, in this case, the technology is actually new and interesting, and I don't care. I don't think people care about how it's done, to be honest. Mm -hmm. For those kind of amounts, they probably don't care. Um, but the, the decentralization question is really, really interesting. I think we have a very different perspective here in Australia where most of us have working bank accounts and you know, we have access to all these financial resources. We like the fact that when someone steals our credit card, we're not liable for it. We like the fact that we can reverse credit card charges. Um, you know, we have this whole system that we've been built up. Now, we might not like the fact that we've somehow given Visa and MasterCard the right to tax 1% of our economy on every transaction, but... Um, Generally, the bargain has been in our favour. Um, people in Cyprus don't want to pay like me. That's <laughs> right. Exactly. This is this is our particular um, viewpoint, right? Did you propose changing the uh, entire planet's monetary system just for Cyprus? Is that what <laughs> 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 I'm trying to do? I, 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 we look at we look at the minority. Mm -hmm. that are, clearly, there are there are societal problems. You know, there's yeah. issues around like economies. Well, you, you so, look in the source code for, for the basis block of uh, blockchain. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Hang on, the blockchain. Bitcoin mm. or blockchain? Mm. Uh, block, uh, sorry, Bitcoin, sorry. Both mm. make sense, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's um, Chancellor of the Exchequer dealing with the banks for a second time just to fix it. So, okay. okay, to be clear, right? remember how I said the one way to timestamp something is to publish it in a newspaper? This was the established, I think it's mentioned in the Satoshi paper. This is why he put the newspaper headline in there. I really still mean to go through and actually look through the headlines that he could have chosen. Was it just this happened to be the one, or did he go, no, nah, today's the day, that is the perfect headline, I'm gonna put that one in. But he had to put a headline in that obviously he couldn't manipulate um, to prove that he had not pre-generated the Bitcoin Genesis block. That's why it's there. Um, Obviously, I think he chose one that he thought was maybe made a bit of a statement. I mean, the fact that his registered date of birth was also the date on which the US confiscated gold is <laughs> also a thing. Like, mm. it, you know. Oh, dude, I'm a technical guy. Yeah. I have, we're not even going to go there. Which is, yeah, that's sort of where we're going with the conversation. It sounds like there's a big opportunity. It's, it's, Bitcoin is pretty. Anarchistic, you know. It's so it's okay. Like so so yeah. In, in places where your your currency is terrible, what you do is you buy US dollars. Maybe in the future, what you do is you buy Bitcoin. Well, say that again. If you don't trust your local currency, yeah. you buy US dollars today. US dollars, the biggest deflation in the world. Have you had a look at the Fed World Bank? That's okay. the US. We're talking about US dollars. But, but mm. if, if, if should that change buy Bitcoin? Yes. yes. <laughs> Yeah. 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 <laughs> Look, all I'm saying is, this is the way the world works. Okay. Okay. I think we can go into the weeds here. Yeah. Should we? Think, uh, yeah. I think we're sort of. Um, if unless there's any other questions. Um, yeah, we might wrap it up at this stage. I haven't we're, had enough beers for that conversation. Oh, Jason, have you got a question? Then? Sure, I was just going to um, ask about. 
and some noise made about the Australian Stock Exchange moving on to blockchain. Yeah, uh, Blade Marker. Let's talk about Blade Marker. Let's forget the Bitcoin for a second. But yeah. just the process of blockchain making the transactions that happen on the Stock Exchange public and transparent. Yeah, well, yeah. Stock Exchange is coming on blockchain. So I've seen the press releases too, and it's really interesting because I haven't been able to dig down to what they're actually doing. Yeah. Um, no, unfortunately not. And I'm really curious because it, it seems to be one of those classic what you're actually talking about is something else. Um, they seem to be talking about a system where the, the brokers would presumably, you know, use digital signatures to authorize trades. That's great. It's only a blockchain in the very broadest sense. But to be honest, when we took people talking about blockchain, this is the kind of thing they're talking about. And look, that's, given, given the chess system is, was invented in the 70s, absolutely, this is a huge step forward. Um, probably worthwhile than spending money on in this case. Um, but, you know, it, 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 how much blockchain ends up in the final thing, I would guess it's going to be a very round number. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, it would absolutely, I mean, funnily enough. Um, about history about Blind Master. Yeah, Blind Master was uh, one of the most proud people in JP Morgan who invented something called the credit for swap. And that's basically mm -hmm. the basis of what caused the global financial crisis. Mm -hmm. right? So she's one of the arch criminals that okay. need to be prosecuted and put in jail, just like she did in Iceland. I'm going to get you for our next start. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, was... so she's now the one running uh, small digital asset technology. She's running a Could... uh, project in Sydney to turn the stock exchange into a blockchain, whereby all the agencies yep. can do transactions, not T plus 3 or T plus 2 or T plus 5 or whatever it is, but T yep. plus 4 yeah. 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 Can we take a question from the front here? What yeah. was... So I'd like to go back to something. <laughs> <laughs> Something you said at the beginning of your talk, and it's just about Thank the you. definition of blockchain, right? So does that mean that holistically it's all about transparency? Is, is that what Because yeah. then after that you say that um, it doesn't make sense for a lot of things, but it wouldn't make sense for things that require transparency. So yeah, um, so, so people don't really talk about verifiability. Um, yeah. They talk about decentralization, although most of the blockchain uses kind of have pushed that to the side. So they're really talking about verifiability so and transparency, which kind of go together. Like you can see and you can check that it is doing the right thing, whatever that is for the yeah, system. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's fundamentally what it's about. Um, okay. And in some industries, that's a huge step forward. Um, and you can totally see how that might help yeah. um, in some cases. Done badly, it turns into basically, we'll just keep polling our web page until it changes <laughs> and then you know it's good. Um, <laughs> That's not really a step forward. Mm. So how much of this actually sticks is a good question. But the idea is this open, verifiable yeah. stream of information. Okay. Um, it doesn't ask the question of what you do if you find a problem, though. Problem. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Take a question. Yeah. Lightning Network, uh, is it fair Ooh. to say that uh, Lightning Network is a very important component of that need, that need or to close that gap that you talked about between where the technology is today and all our hopes and dreams of transforming the financial systems in the world. Uh, no, I think it's completely off to the side. I think everyone's going, we're going to do all this. And I'm like, we can do this. This is cool. <laughs> um, I don't think anyone's going, like, you know, okay, ignoring those of us on the lightning spec who think this is awesome, I don't think anyone else is looking hard enough at that. I think they're all going, wow, man, we could replace this with a world currency or we could, you know, it, it's, we're going to totally do house sales on the, you know, they're off doing crazy shit. We're going, hey, we could do this. So, micropayments. Mm. I think it's exciting. I think it's really exciting. Now, mm. sure, it didn't work the first three times we tried it. But this time, <laughs> <laughs> micropayments, like virtual worlds, virtual reality, and all that stuff, has a we'll history of being the cool thing and then dying for technological reasons. Uh, but uh, we've got two. Point. Mm. Yes, maybe. There's three more three questions. Three. We'll take it and then we'll wrap it up cool. here. I'd, we'll go from here, then you, then you. So, sure. so I want to say two things. Number one, um, with lightning's off-chain off scaling, scaling, 
Um, pretty much what's happened is that it seems like the whole industry is kind of getting up on on-chain today, seems to some extent, um, because of the inherent problems with blockchain and latency when the, uh, the packs are spread across the internet. Do you think, feel like there's a possibility down the line, maybe in 20 years' time, with the actual infrastructure of the internet itself, I uh, guess improved where the latency in propagating, you know, um, uh, basically if someone wins a, a crypto for prospect like that, actually speeds up to the point where you, you might want to start doing private blocks and stuff like that. Okay. Do you think that's a possibility? Um, I'm guessing that's a long way because even if you have fiber optic, at the end of the day, when you have your router, that's e electrons, right? It's not light. So, um, okay. I'll let you think, but answer that, I'll have to so, okay, so, so the question is basically, so we have this fundamental debate that, that blockchains don't scale. Um, and at least under the, under the strong assumptions that the, certainly the Bitcoin purists go for, or the Bitcoin protocol goes for, which is that everyone needs to check everything. Um, and part of it is about the amount of connectivity required to just do that. Um, now, if that keeps increasing, does that solve the problem? And the answer is still no. Because, okay, so we look today at like, you know, what, 20 something transactions a second and you kind of do the math and you go, well, if you want everyone in the world to use it, you need to be another like order of a thousand plus, you know, more than, depending on how often people use it and everything else. But then you go, if you also start going, yeah, yeah, but not just for selling your house and buying houses, we want to use it for every single coffee you buy, which is multiple times per person per day. Maybe we need to be a million times more scalable than now. And then we've got Internet of Things and they're going to outnumber people by a factor of 10 to 1. So we probably need to go more like a billion times more. 10 billion times more than we are now. And however many doublings we get in the whole rate of fiber and stuff, we don't get there for an awfully, awfully, awfully long time. And by the time we have, we've probably got even more IoT things. So it seems like the demand for this blockchain idea is sort of infinite. Um, and even if we push scaling, we go, cool, we can go up by a factor of 1,000, it's still not enough. Um, so we will require these, these, um, the, these upper layers of scaling. But the other reason is fundamentally that that 10 minute delay. And even if you cut it to five minutes, it still sucks. So when I did Petticoin, I basically stood in front of the stupid like cash register thing and I went, how long am I prepared to wait before it accepts my card? And really, I was pissed off after eight seconds. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I'm not waiting five minutes, <laughs> right? And so we were so far away from anything like, you know, that, that blockchain like that, that was gonna work for a normal transaction. You've noticed they've actually gotten faster recently. Tap, you know, mm -hmm. It really gets the whole dialing connecting thing anymore. Like a lot of places you, you tap it, three seconds later you're done. Yeah. Yeah. And three seconds is annoying because you take your card away to us, oh shit, you know, mm -hmm. no. You want to keep it down to like, you know, sub-second is good. Um, 60 times a second even better, but sub-second is good. Mm -hmm. for. So yeah. What do you see as the government's challenges that need to be overcome by open source yeah. in general? Or any currency that's going to be more like that? So open source governance has always been fascinating to me. Um, I worked on the Linux kernel, which is a, um, has a strong leader. Um, and Linux basically makes the calls at the end of the day. He delegates huge swaths of the kernel. So for example, the module subsystem, which is actually kind of, kind of important, um, I was in charge of, right? That was my thing. And I basically, people submitted things to me and I said yes or no, or we're gonna fix it or whatever else. Um, I tried not to be an asshole about it, but that was just, you know, that part. And there were like lots of other people who looked after different parts, and it was this sort of informal hierarchy. Um, or sorry, it became a formal hierarchy in the end. It was the maintainer's files. So this person looks after this, and this person looks after this. Um, you know, and I, and I transitioned that out, so you know, it, 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 it moved across. Um, my work on the Linux kernel was more important than any of the work that I've done on Bitcoin. Just as far as like any economic things, you know, if everyone loses all their Bitcoin, that's less damage than if all the Linux in the world vanishes, right? So it was a really important job and nobody really had huge angst over governance questions in the Linux world. It was like, well, um, Linus is kind of a dick, but he's kind of in charge, and he, he, will make, we try, he makes technical decisions. And if we don't like it, we can go elsewhere, but he's got such a good track record of making good technical decisions that our chances, like, even when I disagreed with Linus, I didn't go off and go, fuck it, rustic's time, we're going to fork the project, right? Because even though, even, he was right even when he was wrong, right? So he kind of, because somebody needs to make those decisions in a project and goes that way. Um, 
I was always suspicious of projects that did not have a strong leader for exactly this reason, because my Linux experience led me to believe that that works really well. Uh, Bitcoin, for example, does not have a strong leader. And for a long time, I didn't understand why Satoshi would have chosen. So Satoshi Nakamoto was the pseudonym used by the anonymous uh, founder of Bitcoin, who released the paper in the initial code, and then she vanished after you know, like five years or whatever. So, um, and I often wondered why that was, like, and I came up with a whole heap of theories. It only occurred to me when the governance question started becoming a thing that this was a key reason for Satoshi to vanish, and that is that the founder of a project has a huge amount of sway on the project. Um, people love dealing with the founder, and Linus used to get this all the time. Like big companies, when they were first discovering Linux, they'd want to talk to Linus, and he'd like, I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> you know, um, I remember when the IBM lawyers wanted to use the Linux logo, and they wanted the sign-off from Larry Ewing, who actually wrote the logo, to make sure it was okay. And he's like, no fucking way. If I do this for you, I'm gonna do this for everyone. They want the guy. They want the guy, it's always a guy. They want the guy. They wanna to talk to them, right? They wanna do their deal. You know, they're, they're, they're the CEO of big company. They wanna to talk to the CEO of Linux, or the CEO of Bitcoin. And they wanna do the deal, right? This is why Coinbase love fucking Ethereum, because they can talk to the guy, you know? So, you want that, you know, they wanna to talk to the person who's in charge. By removing themselves from the picture, Satoshi completely gutted that whole model for, for Bitcoin. Nobody is in charge. The developers who are there, who have commit access, are deliberately hugely apolitical, because they don't even want to give you the impression that they're in charge. And they're really concerned with increasing the number of people who can actually read the code and check that what they're doing is sane, and spot any mistakes before they go in, and, and complain loudly should any political decisions get tried to be snuck through that process. So on the Bitcoin side, there's an incredible awareness of this. Every other project is the opposite. They're like, well, of course I'm in charge because I want to make money, so I'm going to run this project. Ethereum, I said, did everything differently from, from Bitcoin, and one of the things was, we are going to do so much awesome stuff that we are going to change the protocol. And there were a number of promises in the early days of Ethereum, we're going to change, we're going to leave proof of work. They basically guaranteed they were going to have strong development leadership the whole way through. The developers were in charge of Ethereum, there was no doubt. And that was always the way. Um, so that makes it a very different governance model. They have questions like, hmm, well, all my friends lost tens of millions of dollars. Should we completely change the protocol? Like Bitcoin doesn't even have that quest, like no, there's no one in charge to do that. Mt. Gox lost a crap load of money and nobody ever said, we should change Bitcoin to fix it. We just went, <laughs> Oops, don't do that. So when I look at broad governance of every other project, they have set themselves up to be the central point because they want to make the money. And that's how you do it. As a result, they have governance issues. They have fundamentally compromised governance issues. The Bitcoin world has its governance problems, but by default it is because no one's in charge. And when we don't all agree, things stop. And we just get what we have today and things don't improve. Thank you. There's just one last question, and yeah, we'll wrap it up after that. I know you're itching to go. Uh, last year, I actually asked you, what's your biggest challenge, what you were liking? And you said, I believe you said, uh, path by finding or routing. Is that correct? Um, uh, biggest challenge working on Lightning is to talk the hype down and stop people like. So, <coughs> so the Lightning Network is this, like, you know, it's, 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 in, it's in alpha, beta kind of stage now and stuff. and Literally, the other day, somebody dumped like $50,000 into channels. And the Lightning devs have this secret, like, you know, um, <clears throat> back channel signal group between us. And we're like, okay, whose implementation are they running? Because you are so fucked right now. Um, <laughs> like, world's biggest bug bounty down to you right there. You know, I mean, um, so, so talking people down and going, don't get enthusiastic. Here's, here's the reality. You know, test it out with small amounts of money because. You know, that way if you lose all your money due to a bug, I can buy you a beer and we're kind of even, uh, rather than going, oh, I see, I'm sorry, they repossessed your home because our software broke. That's probably our biggest challenge at the moment. Um, the routing thing, um, there's been a whole heap of work on. Um, uh, we've got the summit coming up in, in Adelaide in November, um, and this will be one of the topics, but it hasn't been the big one. Um, we've got some small optimizations in place, and so far we're good. Until we hit the first million or so users, I think we're okay. Sorry, until we hit the first 10 million users, because most users don't have public routes. So um, at this stage, 
that bit is holding. It's all the other stuff that's going to probably mess us up. Mm -hmm. I just want to quickly expand what you're saying before. Sorry, everyone. Um, so this whole way, um, because Bitcoin doesn't have a leader, it seems like big business kind of fit themselves with Bitcoin. So there's been this whole uh, blockchain but, but not Bitcoin thing, which doesn't really make much sense, right? So when I, I just came back from the Bay Area in San Francisco, and um, there's a team from Berkeley, and you know, they work for Hyperledger and all that type of stuff. But pretty much all Hyperledger is is trying to uh, make, trying to make business, big business comfortable with affiliating them with Bitcoin. Because they don't want to affiliate with Bitcoin, but blockchain, right? Yeah. So they work with Hyperledger because Hyperledger is not Bitcoin, it's blockchain. And they don't actually provide any value. It's just a proof of concept to make them feel happy, right? Um, and so what we're seeing is the intermediary point. We're going to have these private blockchains that are making big business very happy. And we have a $740 million blockchain deal. I have with the government. The government's not going to get any value out of that. It's just back-end stuff like what Professor was saying, right? So we, I think we're going to have this intermediary period of five, 10 years where big business will be happy. And they're going to realize, oh, we don't actually get any value from that. Right? That's what's happening right now. And, we have a lot of business development, development managers can talk a lot and government and anything. Yeah. That's what's happening. But to be fair, we went through this with Linux. I mean, businesses didn't know what the fuck to do with Linux when it arrived. Uh, who's going to support this? Uh, what, uh, I'm not paying for it. It's got to be shit. It was literally like, and these were these are literal quotes, right? Um, it took years for them to get accustomed to this idea that you could have software that was like software produced by a company for profit could, could totally an understandable model. Um, but the idea that people would produce software without being compensated for it was so foreign to so many people. It took a generation. Those people had to die, and the younger people replaced them. And when Linux had always been a thing, and then it was okay. I thought it was <laughs> that was that was look, and, and the infrastructure definitely helped and stuff like that. But literally, there were people who were like, you know, it was you, you may not run Linux in this organisation kind of thing. It was it was a huge theme through the nineties. And, and that just had to die. Those, you know, it, it, it just takes that long. Um, and we're in that totally fair phase now with, with Bitcoin, not blockchain. With blockchain, people have managed to like kind of hype that up. But the Bitcoin thing is totally one of these, you will not Bitcoin in this company kind of thing. And that's going to take time, right? Mm -hmm. um, for, I wouldn't trust Bitcoin. It's been around nine years, right? I've got a nine-year-old, right? <laughs> I don't let her drive, right? <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> yeah, so you know, I'm, I'm like, that's you know, at, at some point, um, at some point, it'll be something that's always been there. But until then, it's an experiment, and I think that's really important to bear in mind. Mm -hmm. the closing words is that this stuff is an experiment, and anyone who tells you differently is definitely selling you something. Excellent. I was just going to ask for a closing word.